Um, and, and thank you for those who've uh, come today, and, and thank you to ODI for organizing this session. So I, I represent uh, Igarate Institute, which is a, a small uh, NGO in Rio. I also work for a group called the SECDEV Institute, uh, or SECDEV Group in, in Ottawa. And I'm also, uh, I teach at um, the, the Catholic University in, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and I apologize to the millions and millions of people watching online uh, to, to the fact that I, I will have a visually intensive presentation, so I'll be perhaps drawing attention more to the slides uh, and away from me, perhaps. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, in any case, let me start right into it um, and, and, and talk a little bit about Haiti before we start. Haiti's a small country uh, of roughly 10 million people, of which uh, some say up to one-third uh, reside in, in the capital, Port-au-Prince, though no one really quite knows. Um, socially, economically, politically, security-wise, environmentally, it, it, it's a very challenging situation. I'm not going to endeavor to explain its various challenges today, uh, but it does rate as one of the poorest countries, uh, in, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, if not the world, uh, in spite of being just 700 miles off the coast of, of the U.S., a uh, one-point-hour flight away from Florida. Uh, it's described in the media and in policy circles as suffering from extreme rates of uh, violence and, and insecurity. This is the narrative that we have about Haiti globally. Uh, and it's a real concern not just to Haitians, obviously, but to the 13,000 plus NGOs that are, are based in Haiti. Uh, so I'm describe Haiti as the Republic of NGOs uh, since the earthquake, but also before. Um, but it's also a real factor for investors, for creditors, for, for people who are interested in investing in, in this particular country, uh, seeking possible investment. So, I want to sort of draw your attention to a few pictures, and, and this is the archetypical or quintessential image of, of Haiti, sort of marauding street gangs, dilapidated houses, menacing youth, uh, ripe for recruitment into armed groups. Uh, and this was repeatedly stressed in the media. These kind of images uh, per pervasive in the media um, of all types, uh, both before and, and after the earthquake. And, and most media uh, reported and screamed, really, about the armed group threat uh, in, in the days and weeks and months following the quake. And, and, and as you might expect, it justified a, a fairly securitized kind of response, as it did previously in the previous decade in the 1990s. And I guess the first question I'm going to ask today, uh, and the first question that we had in thinking about surveys, was is this the right image? Is, is Haiti uh, more or less threatening than, say, its neighbors, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, you know, St. Kitts and Nevis, Barbados, or even Dominican Republic next door, uh, or even indeed across the rest of Latin America. This is another image of Haiti, poor, chaotic, and badly trained policemen, uh, concerns that there are not enough, that they're outgunned by these menacing gangs I just showed you. Uh, they suffer from a lack of discipline, experience, and equipment. There's also widespread concerns, and some of them justified perhaps, that they're repeatedly involved in human rights violations, and including violence committed against Haitians. Uh, and sort of low levels of confidence in the police is, I think, in many ways justified, or certainly been the rationale for heavy, heavy investments from the international community, both multilaterals and bilaterals over the years in security sector reform, particularly from the U.S., from Canada, the European uh, Union, uh, uh, and, and the U.K. This is a third and final image uh, of what many believe is occurring in Haiti. Uh, this suggests a violent people, that vigilante uh, justice prevails, that group lynchings are the norm. In other words, Haitians are taking security into their own hands, as they've always done, defending life and, and, and family and neighbor. Uh, this image is quite persistent, not just in the international media, but, but also in the capital of Haiti, the capital Port-au-Prince, and particularly one neighborhood, Pietionville, uh, which is where most, for those of you who know Haiti, uh, and for those of you who don't, is, is the neighborhood where most of the NGOs and, and donors reside. And it's, I would say, these three images have in many ways shaped the security policies of donors and some NGOs who are in many cases loath to visit areas outside of Piechonville uh, into the, into the so-called popular zones or the quartier de favorisé uh, and whose insurance creditors, I should add, uh, don't allow them easy movement. And it, 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 it persists in, in separating, I would say, the foreigners, les blancs, um, from the Haitians. So given these sort of persistent negative images of Haitian gangs, Haitian police and Haitian justice, there's an understandable preoccupation amongst donors. And as I said, considerable investments have been made in, in promoting security and the rule of law since the early 1990s through UN resolutions and uh, both in the Security Council and the General Assembly. And there have been several successive UN missions to Haiti since Aristide, the, the popularly elected uh, president of, uh, in 91, was first elected. And most of these missions have emphasized a combination of peacekeeping, peace support, uh, and increasingly stabilization. There's also been two failed attempts at disarmament, demob, and, and reintegration, DDR. First in the mid-1990s, um, uh, uh, subsequent to the, the banning of the uh, Haitian army, or the disbandment of the Haitian army, 
and then again in 2004 and 2006. And more recently, you've seen an evolution of what you might call stability-type operations, funded both by the U.S., but, but also through MINUSTA, through the U.N. mission that's there today, uh, including a, a, as well as a, a so-called community violence reduction program, which is a $14 million program um, uh, funded by, the, by MINUSTA, um, which is uh, essentially seeking to promote security in these popular zones. So my group, uh, IGAPE, together with my colleague, Athena Colby, who unfortunately isn't here today, who is very much the engine, intellectual engine behind much of this work, were interested in the extent to which these security interventions were both uh, legitimate, the extent that they were responsive to particular security need or threat, uh, but also the extent to which some of these interventions have improved safety and security. So first thing you do when you want to do this kind of assessment is you want to say, well, what's out there in terms of your data? You don't want to run around and, and, and just sort of launch into surveys. Well, in spite of considerable investment in security sector reform, DDR, peace support operations, et cetera, there's a surprisingly lim limited amount of information uh, or evidence to justify both the, the motivation for these kinds of heavy-handed interventions, uh, but also their valuation. There's virtually no systematic data collected across the board, and what there is is uh, quite patchy, sporadic, and often unvalidated. So our group have undertaken uh, probably about 20-plus surveys since 2004. Um, in Haiti. Uh, some of them are national, some of them are, are, are based in, in Port-au-Prince. Uh, and we're now doing a combination of, of sort of annual surveys and monthly polling just to kind of keep a, a steady track of, of these kinds of, uh, these kind of phenomena. Most of them are semi-randomized and, and they're representative, as I said, at, at, at sort of various scales. Uh, and we have a team of over 35 well-trained, exceptionally well-trained Haitian uh, researchers, um, all of them repeatedly uh, trained uh, on a regular basis and, and also who we support to publish. And that's a really important uh, component of our, our research agenda. Our survey methods um, tend to be a combination of GPS, uh, coordinate sampling techniques, and using a two-stage approach. Uh, but I should emphasize, that, and this is a, a key message, that we do supplement a lot of our, our work with multiple approaches using surveys, uh, as well as qualitative focus groups, um, using different kinds of narrative discourse analysis tools like Nudist, and uh, increasingly now we're using a, a tool called Photo Voice, and also extensive key informant interviews. Um, and in a separate impact assessment that we've been running since February this year that will be completed in the next couple of weeks, just to give you an idea of the kind of multiplicity of tools we use, we have 29 separate tools um, that we're applying to do an impact assessment, uh, a combination of, of both semi-randomized uh, instruments to look at beneficiary and non-beneficiary populations, but also uh, directed surveys at, at purpose of sampling, at, at specific population groups as well as focus groups. So it gives you an idea of the kind of the range of different instruments we use, and I, I don't certainly want to walk away today saying that, you know, perception surveys are the only tool that we're not to use in, in these kind of contexts. But by no means do I want to walk away with that particular message. Um, the themes of our surveys are wide-ranging. Uh, today, I'm going to focus primarily in, in the eight minutes that are left for me uh, on issues of victimization and insecurity, uh, as well as attitudes towards service providers, just to give you a sense of some of the discrete findings before I move into what we think are the impacts. Um, we draw, I should emphasize, on sort of established instruments and methods and tools and, uh, that are out there. So for example, we will rely on feud security indices developed by established academics or, or multilaterals. We will use, for example, the Harvard Trauma Scale to look at issues of psychosocial impact. So we're not, we're not reinventing the wheel in our survey. We're drawing on established good practice to the extent possible. In some cases, we developed our own, our own instruments. So what do we find? Well, the first point <coughs> is that our survey is indicated, and this is 2004 to 2009. I'll come to 2010 in a moment, uh, and 2011, 2012. But our first point was that Haiti actually exhibits one of the lowest homicide rates in the Caribbean, roughly 8 to 10 per 100,000, and it plummeted um, by, by around 2009. And just to put this in perspective, this is fully three to five times less than any of its nearest neighbors. So Haiti is well below the regional uh, average. And it's also important, I think, to disaggregate homicide rates by area. So this is just showing three particular neighborhoods in Haiti, some of which may be familiar to those of, those of you who, who are following the situation, Cité Soleil, uh, Bel Air, and Marisson, which are all seen as a sort of the most dangerous, the most volatile areas. And the, and the key point here is we actually have relatively low homicide rates. And I, I should emphasize that this is a longitudinal survey, and you wouldn't have been able to capture this with a cross-sectional, single snapshot. So it's another key message I want to leave with you is the importance of uh, longitudinal approaches. Just to, to carrying on the sort of theme of, of victimization, the same sort of downward trends apply for physical assaults uh, as well as sexual violence. I, I'm only showing you here physical assaults per 100,000, where we see a, a downward trend. I, I should emphasize, and I'll come back to this point if I have time at the end, there has been a spike 
in, in the last sort of eight to 12 months. Um, and, and we've been tracking that as well. Um, I won't go into the, the specific details of, of which population groups, but I, I should emphasize that this is all highly disaggregated. So we have it for distinct age groups, we have it for gender. We, I could tell you the proportion of people who are susceptible or at risk of, of particular types of, of physical assault or sexual assault, et cetera. I could also tell you the distinctions between IDPs and, and, and non-IDPs. So we do have a, a capacity to segregate a, at a fairly uh, sort of granular level. This is, um, we did a survey sort of within the first five weeks of the earthquake. So we, we had a team that was on the ground in 2009 and we were able to mobilize them within a couple of weeks of the earthquake and, and run a, a, survey, a repeat survey with the same geo, geo references uh, of the population group that we'd sampled in 2009 to look at the changes uh, over a, a sort of a six to 12 month period. And what we found here, which is kind of interesting, is that um, fully uh, almost 90% of the population claimed not to be a victim of any kind of serious property crime before 2010. Uh, there was a, a spike in property crime um, you know, after the earthquake. But when you look at the kind of type of property crime, what you saw was property crime that went to $5 range. So it was small theft, often neighbor to neighbor. It wasn't sort of the, the mass looting and marauding that we, uh, we often sort of associated with Haiti uh, in, in, the, in the media. Uh, ditto with issues around household reporting of property crime. And this is just a slide that simply shows the longitudinal reporting uh, of different kinds of, of, of crime that was being reported. Uh, and what you see is, is frankly, not a, an enormous spike between 2009 and 2010. If anything, you see uh, sort of a, uh, only a, a marginal increase. We wanted to ask also questions around who would you turn to? In other words, what was the, the level of confidence that you had in, in state institutions um, and otherwise in, in, in a place like Haiti? And what we found here, again, if you go back to my second slide of, of the poorly trained uh, human rights violating police, what we found was actually a, a dramatic increase in the, the likelihood of people reporting that they would turn to the police. Um, in 2010 as compared to 2009. It was already actually quite high in 2009, right? Fully 40% fully of the population claimed that they would turn to the police in the event uh, of an event of, of either being robbed or threatened. We also see a, a high proportion of people who otherwise would have done nothing in 2009, uh, or sorry, otherwise would have, have, have done nothing in 2009, actually reducing and actually turning to neighbors, turning to other forms of institution, local authority structures. Uh, so just again, showing variation over time and just emphasizing the importance of longitudinal surveys. A major question in Haiti, uh, and particularly since the election of, of President Martelly uh, last year, is the role of MINUSTA, the UN mission uh, and the armed forces. There's a, a lot of pressure right now, uh, and there has been over the last year or so, uh, to draw down on MINUSTA after eight years, um, after eight years. Uh, and and um, considerable pressure domestically since the outbreak of, of cholera. And this slide shows some interesting trends before and after the quake. And I think challenges in many ways are conventional wisdom. And perhaps, if nothing else, suggests that we need a certain level of humility about the, the relative importance and influence of, of our international donors uh, uh, or otherwise. I'm going to skip the slides around police. But again, we're looking at the, the relationship uh, between Haitians and, and their impressions of the police. And what we see is a fairly high and consistently high uh, and favorable view of the police, which again challenges, I think, some of the conventions uh, and, and attitudes that we have as, as external actors. I just want to show you this slide here. This was um, a different kind of method of, of collecting data. This is a, a combination of focus groups, of armed group members, of community leaders, a whole vast array of focus groups. And what we did was we used um, a, a nudist tool to try to look at the relative influence of particular perceived risk factors that were attributed uh, to youth joining armed groups. And it's just another way, again, of presenting data. And, and the relative size was the number of times that people attributed uh, the, the, the likely risk of joining a gang to that particular uh, cluster of words. We did the same thing in the case of protective factors. So again, just an idea of how to represent data in, in a way that allows for kind of a fairly rapid reading uh, of, of, a, of so, you know, quite complex phenomena. And finally, we looked at gang membership over time. And we saw relatively low rates of, of, of um, folks uh, seeking to join gangs. Again, challenging conventional wisdom. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take that as my last minute. <laughs> So essentially, <laughs> I was asked to talk about impacts. So let me just say a few words about impacts. What are the impacts of all this? Well, the first thing I got to say is I think we have to be really modest with the extent to which we, we ourselves as a research community influence policymakers. And the second point is I think we need to be, um, you know, we have to think about multiple ways of seeking to impact. And I guess the first point I wanted to make here was um, we understand that in order to have a certain amount of legitimacy and credibility with, let's say, the donor of the World Bank or the, or the bilateral or the NGO, it's often useful to have academic 
publications, right? Publications that are published and established in esteemed journals, such as, for example, Disasters. Uh, so one of, our, one of our objectives in the course of this exercise was to get some of our work fast-tracked and into established academic journals so that we could actually have a foot to stand on when we wanted to make our claims. The other set of ways of influencing was through media. And we issued a number of op-eds um, early on in the process and then followed that up with some AP feeds, some wire service. Uh, and we managed to get this out in, in, in 2012 in our most recent survey. We got it to about 450 different independent media outlets uh, who reported on the story. So again, part of the whole influencing and impact process is seeking not just to get academic credibility, but also seeking to get this out into the public media. Um, and this is an example of some of the, some of the groups that, that uh, picked us up. And the third element, I guess, is policy impacts. I'll close here. Um, and there are sort of three clusters of actors that we are seeking to influence in the course of our, our, our various assessments. First cluster you might describe as a multilateral, <laughs> sort of bilateral, um, sort of an, an Haitian government sort of sector. Those would be our primary audience. Uh, and so a lot of our work was fed directly into the PDNA, the Post-Disaster Needs Assessment, uh, and in subsequently into PRSPs and into the UNDAFs and into various kind of planning frameworks, <laughs> which for some people matter, uh, for others perhaps less so. But it was important to give this group a baseline against which they could start making reasonable and informed policy decisions. The second cluster were bilaterals. Um, bilaterals uh, don't like bad news stories often. Uh, they're quite comp they're happy to hear them informally, but they certainly don't like them screamed in the media. Uh, so we had a strategy to work with bilaterals to to informally workshop the results and talk to them about what the policy conclusions would be, perhaps to challenge some of those sec knee-jerk security first responses. And the third clutch were, were really the NGOs. And I would say that those were perhaps, perhaps the ones we, we had the least influence over. Um, relief agencies tend, I think, as a rule, to put a priority over delivery uh, rather than, than information analysis. And that's not a criticism. I think it's just a function of the way the, the industry operates. Um, but some took us much more seriously than others. So the final reflections are simply the critical role of, of timely and targeted evidence. I think one of the, the priorities for us as a research community is to make sure that we get our stuff out rapidly um, and, and it, that it's targeted, but across multiple outlets. And I think that's something that often researchers struggle with, is, is to work those multiple constituencies. The second is the importance of transparency in your methods. Be absolutely clear about what your things say and what they don't say. And I obviously didn't have time to go into the methodology. The third, I'd say, is that just the theme of the, 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 the meeting today is that surveys offer, I think, a really rapid and, and potentially cost-effective approach, but they must be supplemented with other kinds of methods. Uh, one should never, I mean, the reason we talk about triangulation, uh, we, would, uh, we would recommend a minimum of three different types of approaches to verify uh, one's, one's research. The fourth and perhaps one of the most fundamental points for perception surveys is you've got to have well-trained local teams. Um, it's garbage in, garbage out, and you absolutely need to invest the energy, the time, uh, and the resources into ensuring that your local teams uh, are serviced. And finally is the importance of uh, longitudinal and geotagged data sets, and I, I suspect both of my colleagues will reflect a bit more on, on that as well as the challenges in the next presentation. Thank you.